to Shop Talk, episode number seven with Jim and Ken. I'm Jim. I'm Ken. Hey, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, a couple more topics to talk about. I'm going to cover some new features of software release 2.9.1 for the WTM radios. And what do you have for us, Ken? Yeah, hey, thanks, Jim. Uh, today I wanted to talk about a topic which is a power over Ethernet or POE. Um, we're going to get into a couple of little details here, but generally what uh, the question that comes to me is, uh, can I run my WTM radios on PoE? And the answer is always yes, followed by the word but. And, and so we want to talk about what that, what that means. You know, why would you choose PoE? Why wouldn't you choose PoE? The first thing I want to talk about is more philosophical than anything else. And that is, for me, in our, our radios, almost every WTM radio that you're going to get from us delivers a gigabit capacity or more. And since our radios have SFP plus interfaces on them, you're very likely going to run a fiber interface to the network of the radio, and that gives you all of your capacity on one connection, which is what everybody wants. If you're doing that, then the next question would be, why would you do PoE for the power when you could do direct DC for the power? And in my book, DC is just more reliable than PoE. You have less electronics involved, you have less losses, and more importantly, you're not running a Cat5 or Cat6 cable up a tower, which presents new problems such as surge protection, grounding, bonding, that kind of thing. Um, you know, we see a lot of things go wrong, if you will, with Cat5 going up towers, just with uh, surge protection and grounding that you get lightning strikes that, that damage equipment, maybe not the radios, but something else. And so we'd like to try to avoid that. And DC is a whole lot easier to protect um, than a Cat5 cable is. So in, in general, I'm just in favor of using DC power over PoE. So get off the soapbox for a minute and let's talk about the practical things. If you really wanted to run PoE, maybe you've already got a cable in place for that, or that's just what you're used to running. Then first thing to realize is that if it's a single network connection, you're gonna be limited to a gigabit capacity on that interface. That might be fine for your management port, but it might not be fine for your traffic port. So again, you might be running a fiber alongside the PoE cable, fiber for the network, Cat5 for the power, maybe Cat5 for management. You know, keep in mind, we have two fiber ports on the radio, so you could always run a secondary fiber port for management as well if you're trying to run out of band management. So there's lots of versatility here. Okay, so we're done with that part. Now let's talk about what's really more about the electronics of the equipment. There are some limitations to running PoE on some of our gear. And there's actually a big table in our product information guide that you can get if you have access to our Aviat Care site. Um, but the easy things to remember is that our dual core our WTM 4200 radio at six gigahertz and 11 gigahertz, they will run on PoE. However, you can't always run full transmit power on those radios if you're running PoE. There's basically not enough uh, current uh, delivered by the PoE system to run those radios at full transmit power. So there are some limitations at 11 gigahertz and six gigahertz on the dual core radios. There aren't any limitations on the single core radios. Now, as we go up to the higher frequencies, 18 and 23 gigahertz, we don't have those limitations. So you can run PoE on the dual cores for those higher frequency radios. We talk about 80 gigahertz, the same thing is kind of true there. The single core radio and even the multiband radio can run on a P on PoE systems without any limitations. We also will have the WTM 4880, which is a dual core 80 gig radio, so 20 gigabit per second capacity radio. That radio has limitations on it as well for PoE. So a lot of things to keep track of. We can help you with that. Obviously, consult with us when you're thinking about your power system. But you can get away with uh, eliminating that entire conversation if you just go to DC power on everything. So not only is that uh, an easy solution to think of, but also a more reliable solution in my book regarding things like grounding and bonding and that sort of thing. So that's it for me today on PoE. All right, well, thanks Ken for sharing that. Yeah, really important to understand those differences. Again, that information is in our product ordering guide and probably even easier to get a hold of one of us. We'll help you sort through the details, depending again on which frequency band drop rating and which model radio to make sure we address you know, any sort of limitation and you understand that going into it. So with that being said, I'm going to uh, come over here. I've got a couple new features that I want to talk about on our uh, new software release, 2.9.1 for WTM. So let me toggle my laptop over here. 
and we're going to log into a WTM radio. I've just up at 9.1, so you can immediately tell that in the bottom left corner here of my screen, it shows you the firmware version running. So that's a quick way of seeing that's on every page at the very bottom. Okay, so the new feature is on the sensors tab. What I'll do is I'll scroll down here, and what I'm able to see is my SFP module. And on here, we've got some new information that wasn't displayed before on the radio. What it shows me is my uh, light level receive power on the fiber optic cable. It also shows me my transmit power. And what this is useful for is uh, SFP modules, just like a radio signal, have got a range that they can operate in. Um, the signal's too low, you're going to have errors on the SFP cable. If the signal is too strong, you're overdriving it, again, you're going to have errors uh, on your um, data stream coming through. So what this allows us to do is actually see what the uh, levels are for receive power and transmit power on the SFP. I've had uh, one customer just recently that installed some fiber optic cables. However, they were fairly short and he was overdriving it. So we uh, got some inline optical attenuators to reduce that signal. And by being able to see the actual signal level here, we were getting it within the acceptable operating range. So that's the first new feature I want to show you on 2.9.1. The second feature is the ability to control what's called linked status propagation. So I'll scroll down here and show you how this works. So linked status propagation is a new feature we've just added. And what this is designed for is uh, if you've got a radio link up and running and perhaps you're switching and routing uh, keeps track of the ethernet port status. And if you were to have a deep fade across the RF link and the radio link were to go down, but the ethernet port was still active, your switcher router may not realize that that path is no longer valid and still trying to push packets down there, which will give you packet loss rather than reroute to an alternate path. Well, we've got this new feature here that we can enable and I'll go ahead and just walk you through this. Uh, we'll enable this for gigabit ethernet one and what we're gonna do is we'll monitor our radio interface now, if the radio interface should go down, what we can set here is the uh, time that it's got to be down for before it will disable my, my Ethernet interface, in this case, Gigabit Ethernet 1.1. So maybe I'm going to say, I want to make sure that the link is down for at least 10 seconds, the RF link is down. And then what I can do is set some additional parameters of how long I'm going to um, disable my Ethernet port once the radio link goes down. Again, this is so that the upstream router can detect this is no longer a valid path and then it can do its reroute and send your traffic on a, a backup path. The time to restore setting here is uh, if you're doing in-band management, so say you've got that single cable going up to the radio, well if we disable the Ethernet port we've lost communication to the radio. So this value here will um, bring the Ethernet port back online after the amount of time we've specified so then you can log back in, uh, see what's going on with the radio, maybe look at some signal strengths, maybe you're getting interference or whatnot. But that's the um, parameters you can adjust. So again, this is really useful for networks that are, um, have got a primary and a backup route and you need to quickly switch and if the radio is not directly talking to the router, and it's not able to tell what the um, performance of the RF link is, we've got the ability now to basically mute the Ethernet port for a specific amount of time and then come back online. And this will give your router, upstream router, a chance to reroute that traffic. And then the last feature I'm going to show you here is our adaptive modulation. So our radio today has got adaptive modulation that goes from QPSK up to 4096 QAM. So as our RF path will fade, uh, I'm talking particularly on the E-band, this is where this is useful, this new feature. As the E-band uh, path will fade, we're going to step down in modulation. So as we can see here, well, we're up and running and our E-band carrier is up and running and what we're going to do is as we fade this path, what will happen is the modulation will drop from step to step to step. And once we've reached our bottom modulation, which is QPSK, with this new feature is we can now do adaptive channel width. So we can now start cutting our channel size in half. And we um, call this a QPSK uh, one half and QPSK one quarter. So it's basically, uh, we, if we start out at a 2000 megahertz wide channel, the next step we hit the bottom of that, we'll drop down to a 1000 megahertz wide channel as the link continues to fade 
and we're losing signal, we'll drop down to a 500 megahertz wide channel. So we've got basically two more channel steps we can narrow up to give us better system gain to keep that link up and running. Now if we started out say at a thousand megahertz wide channel, we could then step down and we could go all the way down to 256 megahertz as our skinniest channel on the uh, 80 gigahertz side of the radio. So that's how that works. You can see these steps go up and down as we uh, fade the path and bring it back. And those are really the, uh, the new features of the WTM radios in four, uh, I'm sorry, 2.9.1 uh, software release. All right, any uh, closing thoughts from you, Ken, on that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, there's a couple of uh, things I'd like to amplify in the topics that you covered. Um, for the fiber optics uh, um, values, the one thing that I also see is this will help you identify if you've got a damaged fiber. Um, so if you had like one strand that was bad, you'd see a difference in the RX value coming in on one side versus the other. Right. Um, if you have a switch or a router or something that supports the same kind of features, or the SFP values there, then you can compare the optical levels on one side of the link versus the other, and that's another sort of troubleshooting mechanism you can use. Um, and for the millimeter wave uh, adaptive modulation or adaptive bandwidth feature, um, this is really an intention to uh, extend the uptime of the radio, basically. When you, I don't know if everybody realizes this, but when you go to half of the channel bandwidth, you gain 3 dB of system gain automatically. And so uh, we're basically getting 60 dB extra system gain out of the radio by dropping one half and then dropping one half again. And that'll give you more uptime during like rain conditions and that kind of thing. It does uh, reduce the capacity by half and reduces the capacity by half again, but it basically in increases that uptime. I wanna point out that that would work on the 4800. It works on the multi-band radio as well. And it'll work on the dual band 4800. Um, one thing is we have not yet uh, in, in uh, integrated this feature into the design tool. Um, that will be coming, so you will see that feature automatically added to the design tool down the road, but that's in the next release, not in the current release today. Um, there is kind of a way to fake that, and that is that you can run the calculation. Let's say you were running a 2000 megahertz bandwidth. You can actually run the calculation again at a 500 megahertz bandwidth. That'll show you the bottom end of the performance as far as capacity and uptime. So you can kind of do two calculations in one manually for now. Later on, that'll be built in automatically. Oh, great. Yeah, thanks for those additional pointers, Ken. Very good. Okay, well, thanks for uh, joining us on this edition of Shop Talk. If you like what you see, click on the subscribe button down below, and we'll see you on the next edition. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody.